So anyway, if you don't feel great about this one, you have a dropped quiz grade. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, let's get into today's material. Uh, so last lecture, we went over series and parallel resistances. And that's really what we're going to be doing for uh, most of this unit, like in DL. Uh, just we take batteries and resistors and maybe a switch, which is really just cutting and putting back together a wire. Um, but it's just taking circuits made up of these two components and figuring out what's going on in all the different parts of the circuit. And so when we have resistors, either in series or parallel, our goal a lot of the time is to simplify that into a single equivalent resistance. So the battery doesn't know what it's hooked up to. Think of it as just like a black box. The battery just has an in and an out, a positive and a negative. And I guess it would be the in would be the negative, out would be the positive. But anyway, that's all it feels. And then some total current comes out of the battery depending on that equivalent resistance that it feels. So whether or not it's two resistors in series or two in parallel or a million in some sort of combination, it just feels one resistance. And so if we can simplify all those resistors into a single resistance, uh, we can solve for that total resistance and then kind of work backwards, which I'll do as an example. But to simplify individual elements, the two base ways you can combine resistors is either in series or parallel. If they're in series, we found this relationship here that their resistance is just add up to an equivalent resistance. And to solve that, we use the fact that resistors in series share current. So if you, that's kind of like a definition of resistors that are in series, that if all the current that goes through one of them also has to go through the other, then they're in series. Um, and we also realize that the voltage drops across them don't necessarily have to be equal. Right? If R1 and R2 both get the same current, like I1 and I2 are equal, if the resistances aren't the same, then the voltage drops aren't going to be the same, right? Because minus I times R1 is going to be different than minus I times R2. But they have to add up to a voltage drop that is equal and opposite to the voltage of the battery, which we'll see more later on. But share current, not necessarily voltage. For series, or sorry, for parallel, it's the exact opposite, where they share a voltage drop but not necessarily a current. Well, they definitely don't, uh, yeah, well, they, can, they can share, but they don't necessarily share a current. The reason being is that the total current splits off between these two resistors, right? So in the case we have R1 and R2 in parallel, I total comes out of the battery, I1 goes through R1, R1, R2, sorry, I2 goes through R2, and we know those have to add up to I total because we have conservation of current. We only have a certain amount of charges flowing through the circuit for a second. We can't create or destroy them. And using this information, we were able to solve for this relationship, which is a little trickier, um, but looks kind of similar to the relationship for series resistors. Um, the key thing here is not just that the voltage drops across R1 and R2 are the same, right? No matter what, we're going from one junction to the other. And whatever path we take, we have to have the same voltage drop. But that means if I replace these two with their equivalent resistance. So if I just rip out those branches and put in a single resistor with the equivalent resistance determined from this equation, the voltage drop across that single resistor, I total times REQ, is going to give me the same voltage drop as V1 or V2. Because again, think of it like a black box. I just see one junction and then the other, and some voltage drop has to change. It doesn't matter if there's multiple ways to get there or just a single one. It might look different current-wise, but that voltage drop has to be the same. So I could write delta V1 equals delta V2 equals delta V EQ if I were to replace it there. And that's very important when we solve problems. Um, so we're going to do some examples of that. But first, I'll pose a clicker question to you. Assume all these resistances are the, are the same. So every resistor here just has resistance R. And your question is, uh, which of these sets has the lowest equivalent resistance? So for the clicker questions today, and I guess always, take a sec to, or longer than that, for yourself to work through it, think about your answer. Um, and then after 30 seconds or a minute, I encourage you to talk to the people around you, compare answers, work together, um, and then we'll talk about it. 
right, it's been 45 seconds, so I want to hear the noise level start to raise a little bit. Come on, I played music to loosen you up. You should, should all be very comfortable now. All right, I'm going to stop us there. Nice job. You were definitely louder than section A. Um, so let's go through it together. Um, the answer is D. I'll work through these really quick. If we were going to find the equivalent resistance of D, we just have three identical resistors in parallel. And so we plug these into our equation. We get 1 over REQ equals 3 over R. And then you have to flip both sides to find the answer for REQ, and we get that it's a third of the resistance of one of the resistors. Which makes sense, right? Because we know when we have resistors in parallel, the check, the rule we have is that the equivalent resistance is lower than the lowest resistance we have. And so since those are all R, whatever we found had to be less than R, which R over 3 definitely is. Again, the logic for that, besides just the math always works out, is that imagine you just had that single lowest resistor and then you add any resistor in parallel to it, all you've done is add another way for the current to go. You've allowed it to spread out, made it a bit easier for the current to flow through. And so even if that other resistor is really large and not a lot of current goes through it, you still lighten the load a little bit and reduce the equivalent resistance. OK, so D, we get R over 3. For part A, we just add 2 in series. And so we get 2R. That's bigger than this, so that's not it. For B, we have one resistor in series with two that are in parallel. So if you solve for the two in parallel, we get a similar thing here, except we get R over 2. And so we get R plus R over 2. That's 3R over 2 bigger than this. C, we get R over 2 plus R over 2. So this whole configuration in C is equivalent to just one of those resistors by itself. So that's kind of a wasteful configuration. But either way, it's greater than R over 3. And then E, of course, is also just R. So D has the lowest equivalent resistance. Um, yeah, questions here? So it, not directly related to this example, but I just wanted to do one uh, little experiment here. I guess it's more of a visualization. We're not really going to learn anything new from doing this. But this is a, supposed to be a physical representation of a resistor. So I have a bunch of ball bearings at the end here. These are our charges. And this is the resistor, this board with a bunch of nails sticking out of it, kind of like Plinko, I think, is the game on Price is Right, uh, if that's still playing, that these are going to kind of bounce around through. And of course, they'll be knocking into the nails and slowed down. And so these are our resistor. So what do I need to do? Uh, well, I guess just physically, what do I need to do in order to make these ball bearings roll through the nails to pass through the, what's good, like they're just sitting here, they're not moving. What do I need to do to make them actually want to roll down through here? Lift it up, yeah. I, well, I need to move the block, but I need to lift it up. Give them some potential energy, right? Now they have a higher potential energy than down here, and so they're going to flow down to reduce their potential energy. Now let's think about this as if these were charges and this is a resistor. What would giving, me giving this potential energy, what is that like doing in an electrical circuit? What makes charge want to flow through an electrical circuit? Because otherwise, here's a resistor. It's tough for the charges to get through. They're not going to go through unless you make them. What do I have to do? I have to introduce some sort of energy density difference. Right here, physically, it's gravitational potential energy. This is just like delta PE. That's higher than here, and so they're going to flow from high to low. In a circuit, it would be maybe I put in a battery. right? Now it's 10 volts here, 0 volts here, and so the charge is going to want to flow through. It's going to get forced through the resistor, and it's going to lose that voltage as it goes down. 
as it dissipates energy. Just like these balls, they dissipate energy. They lose gravitational potential energy. Here, they would gain kinetic. So let's try it. I mean, we all know what's going to happen. We flow through. And so we get a smaller flow rate than we would if these nails weren't here, right? If these nails weren't here, they would all just flow right through and we get a much higher flow rate. Just like with, if we increase the resistance of a circuit, we get a lower flow rate. And if we reduce it, we get a higher one. Um, some other ways we could use this, if we double the length of this, right? That would be like putting two resistors in series, right? In that case, we would double the amount of resistance that these charges have to pass through. And if we made this wider, that would be like adding resistors in parallel, right? Now we have more places for these to go out. They don't have to kind of get stuck behind one another. They can all go through maybe at the same time. And so that would increase our flow rate. And if we made it more narrow, reduced the amount of options, the amount of paths for the balls, then they would have to go through single file. And then we'd get a lower flow rate or a higher resistance. So the physical analog here, I think, works down to pretty high level of detail. Um, but anyway, at the end of this lecture, we'll kind of zoom out and see the way of talking about just flow and resistance uh, and energy density outside of the context of even of electrical circuits. Um, okay, so that was just kind of an aside. Let's get back into circuits explicitly. Um, I'm just going to do an example problem. So here we have a medium comp complex circuit. So it has like a mix of series and parallel, but it's not, there's nothing here that's really a trick but we're just going to simplify it together and then work backwards, um, do what I said before, use that total current to try to figure out what's happening at each individu uh, individual part of the circuit. So we have a battery in series with one resistor, which is in series with these couple branches here, which is in series with the other. And so I've gone ahead and labeled the current that we would have at each point. Not the values yet, but where it would be different. Going through R1, we have all of the current. Right? Every charge that goes through the battery has to go through R1. And so I total is what we'll label that current. But then we come down here and we reach a junction. Right Now some of the current can go this way and get to the other side through R4. And some of it can go through the top and go through R2 and R3 and get to the junction also. So it can go either or. In other words, these two branches are in parallel and so they'll have different currents. Right? We'll call I23 the current that goes through this top branch, not just I2 or I3, because all the current that goes through R2 has to also go through R3. Right? So we just have one value of current for the top branch, and then we'll call what's on the bottom I4. And then those come back together, and we get I total again through R5. So let's break this down by simplifying it into REQ. And it turns out this isn't the only way to solve this problem, but I think it's helpful, and it'll give us practice finding REQ. So what do I combine first? If it's not obvious to you, um, that's fine. And it might not always be. We might get like, you might develop a little bit of an intuition about where to start when you're simplifying circuits, which resistors to combine first. But the general rules, I would say, are that when you're combining things in series, you can't cross a junction. So if I want to combine R1 with, let's say, R2, right? Because I'm saying, oh, I can go from R1 here to R2. Why can't I just start by combining those R1 plus R2? Well, I crossed a junction. That's the less formal way to say it, like the more obvious, just like physical. But the more scientific way to say that is R1 and R2 don't share a current, right? There's I total going through R1, but then this piece of I total, I23, that goes through R2. And if they don't share a current, they're not in series. So that's the way, way I can tell I can't combine those. Same thing with like R3 and R5, right? Even though I can trace a line going from R3 through R5, I cross a junction or they don't share a current. So I can't start there. For parallel, our rule is that, I mean, you can really, you should only have one resistance per branch. So if I want to use like, let's say I wanted to combine R2 and R4 and just combine like one, like one over R1, or sorry, one over R2 plus one over R4 equals R, one over RAQ. Why can't I do that? Well, because R3 is also here, right? There's multiple resistors in this branch, and so I have to simplify that before I combine the branches in parallel. And I guess the more scientific way to say that one is that R2 and R4 don't share a voltage drop, right? Going from this junction to this junction 
we have some voltage drop. We decided that it's the same regardless of which path we take. So for R4, that entire voltage drop occurs across R4 because it's the only resistor here. Getting from here to here through the bottom, all of it must happen at R4. But in the top branch, I have to go through R2 and R3. So the sum of the voltage drops here is going to equal the voltage drop here. So R delta V2 is not equal to delta V4. So that's you know, the more explicit way, I guess, to decide that they're not in parallel. Um, but whichever rule makes more sense to you. Either way, using that, like those two rules, the only thing that we can actually start with is combining R2 and R3. So regardless of whether or not that was obvious to you, if you didn't break any rule, you would still end up starting there. So to combine those two, we know they're in series, and so we can just add them together. And so we get this R23, that is 2.5 plus 5 ohms, and we get 7.5 ohms. And still the current going through there is I23, because we didn't chain, like, we purposely put a resistor there that behaves equivalently. So whatever current went through that branch before is still going to. Um, it's also worth noting here that we know the relationship between I total and I23 and I4, right, because I total branches off into these two, and then when they come back together we get I total again. I total is equal to the sum of those, that's just our conservation of current here or junction rule. Uh, and now we can move on. Using those same rules, process of elimination, or if it's just obvious to you, the next thing we do is combine R23 and R4. That's actually the only thing we can do at this point. And those are in parallel. So we have our equation here that 1 over our EQ is the sum of their inverses, and we can solve to find our EQ is equal to 3 ohms. So now if we just wanted to replace this whole box right here, put a black box around these parallel branches with these three resistors organized like that, and just put a single resistor in their spot, I would need to make that resistance 3 ohms. 3 ohms is less than 5, less than 7.5, so we're good. That makes sense. And it's also worth noting here that now I total goes through this R equivalent because we've reduced it from two branches to just one. So there's nowhere else to the, for the current to go. And so the voltage drops we would get from I23 times R23 and I4 times R4 are the same as the voltage drop I would get as I total times R234. Now we're left with three resistors in series, all with I total. And so we can just combine those by adding them together. And we find our completely simplified circuit just has an equivalent resistance of 38 ohms. So this is saying that if I took this battery and hooked it up to either this complex circuit or just a single resistor with a resistance 38 ohms, I would get the same total current. This I total is the exact same thing as that I total. That's the point of why we just took all this care to do that. So let's solve for what that I total is. Here's our circuit. Our loop rule is just epsilon minus I total times R EQ. And so I can rearrange and find that my I total is equal to half an amp. Right, so now we know in any of these circuits on the previous slide, because all of them were equivalent to each other, at every stage we never changed the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit, they should all have an I total of 0.5 amps. So now let's go a step further back. Now we had these three resistors in series. We know the voltage drop across each one of these is just its resistance times the current that goes through it, and the current that goes through all three of these is the same. It's just I total. There's nowhere else for it to go. So delta V1 is negative 10 volts following that. Delta V234 is negative 1.5 volts, and delta V5 is negative 7.5 volts. So now if we want to just double check our work, we know that going through this circuit, we need to satisfy the loop rule, right? So if we gain a bunch of voltage through the battery, after crossing all three of these resistors and going back to where we started, I need to get back to zero. So if the battery's 19 volts, all three of these should add up to negative 19 volts, which of course they do. And so we get that our work so far has been correct and it all makes sense. So now let's go a step further back so we found now that the voltage drop across this equivalent resistor, remember this was replacing two different branches, we found the voltage drop across that is negative one and a half volts. 
So now if I go a step back and replace the two branches, I know that the delta v across each of those branches also has to be negative one and a half volts. Because remember, whether I have this or whether I have the equivalent resistor, if I just took a black box and cover the whole thing, so I just have an input voltage and an output, I'm still going to get the same voltage drop. So both of these have a voltage drop of negative one and a half volts, as does the equivalent resistor. And so I can actually find how much current goes to each side. Because if I know the voltage drop across R23 and I know its resistance, I can just invert and solve. So there's the expression I have. I know that's equal to negative one and a half volts over seven and a half ohms, and I get that 0.2 amps goes through the top. Now there's two ways I can now find how much current goes through the bottom. I can either do the same exact work here, saying that I know the voltage drop is still negative one and a half volts, and now the resistance is five ohms, or I can say, well, I know the total current is 0.5 amps, and I know that 0.2 amps of it go to the top, and so the remaining 0.3 amps must go to the bottom. Right, so either way, they both work. Um, and with circuits, you'll often find this, that there's multiple ways to solve something, because you only have a certain amount of unknowns, and you know, that's just the way algebra works. There's a lot, of, a lot of ways that you can simplify. And of course, if you add these two together, we get 0.5 amps. So we're still, everything's working out. And now we've figured out the total current. We know the voltage drop everywhere. We know the current in each resistor. I won't go further to the only thing we need to do now is split up R2 and R3 back into two resistors, but we know the way to do that. Now that we know the current in this branch is 0.2 amps, I just need to do that current times each of the individual resistors. And of course, we will find that the sum of those two voltage drops gives us that negative one and a half volts that we need across the whole branch. So this is one way that we could have solved this circuit, and I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, the other way you can do it is the loop rule, or I should say loop rules, really. I mean, one rule, but multiple implementations of it. If we look at this circuit, we have two loops we could make, right? We can go through, the, I guess, really three if you wanted to go around here, which we'll talk about at another point. But the two loops I would look at are battery through R1, and then I can go through, let's say, R23, and then R5 and back to the start, or I can do the same thing except go through R4 instead. So those are two perfectly valid loop rules. Then with that and using the junction rule, like you can, we could also find these same answers that way. And mathematically, they're equivalent to what we just did. The reason being, though expressions that we have for like REQ, whether it's for parallel or series, the way we found those expressions was by using the loop rule, right? We use the loop rule, we use the junction rule, and we combine them to get these general things. But you could also just start with a loop rule and that and do it out for yourself every time. Um, you're really, yeah, it, sometimes one is easier, sometimes the other. Sometimes you'll look at a circuit and it's not at all clear how to combine it into REQ, and so if you find yourself stuck and don't know how to simplify, just tell yourself that you know the loop rule and so do that instead. Find some loop that you can make, write it out, make sure your currents are different where they need to be, and see what you can solve. Um, so when stuck, you could just try the other method. And you, I'm not gonna do tons of them in lecture, but uh, you'll see a lot through DL and through practice problems and stuff. And so I highly recommend you uh, get comfortable doing both. Um, okay, questions on this example. So I know there was a lot here. Um, I guess another thing that I'm not explicitly covering in lecture, because it's kind of hard to, is just tricky ways to draw circuits, which you'll also see plenty of in DL. One of my, like, Classic examples is like kind of a butterfly looking thing where the battery is in the center and then the wires go off to either side. That's the same as if those two things were like drawn like a ladder in parallel, like we see other places. So maybe that doesn't land with you right now, me just like making hand movements. But what I'm trying to say is it's not always drawn as straightforward here where it's obvious what's in series and what's in parallel. And so you getting more comfortable seeing different circuits drawn in different ways um, is good. And it's never a bad idea to take a circuit, even once you've solved the problem, and kind of challenge yourself seeing how you could draw it differently and have it behave the exact same way. Um, okay. So now this is a concept that really just extends on what we already know and takes it to an extreme. So it's like shorting a resistor is the word we say, but really what it is is when it's when we add 
a resistance-free path in parallel with a resistor. So this red wire here, I've just drawn it in red to draw attention, but it's the same wire as anywhere else, and I've put it across R2. So now the current comes down to here, and now it can either go through R2 or this red wire, which has no resistance. And which one do you think the current's going to prefer? It's gonna prefer the way without resistance. And it turns out all of the current is gonna go through the red wire, and none of it is gonna go through R2. Like using that analogy we often use with like hallways where, or I guess even with resistors, you have one resistor, you open up another path, and that lightens the load on the other resistor. And then we find that the balance of current, how much goes to each side, just depends on their resistances. More current will go through the easier path. But when one of the paths is infinitely easier to go through than the other, like it is here, this has a zero resistance, and this has some finite resistance, then the split is complete. All of it goes this way. We can prove that, well, it's kind of it's like sloppy math, but if we try to use our parallel circuit equation or parallel branch equation here, I can add a resistor in parallel with resistance zero, which is basically what this wire is. And if you'll notice, I include R1 here as well. Why is that? Well, if this wire is in parallel with R2, which we can, I think we can agree on that, right? Because the current can I, going from this point to this point can either go through R2 or the red wire. So those are definitely in parallel. And if red and R2 are in parallel, and R1 and R2 are in parallel, then the red one must also be in parallel with R1, kind of like transitive properties. I mean, another way to think of it is just look at the initial junction where the current can go either to R1 or keep going down. I can skip R1 by going through the red wire. And so if the current can avoid R1 by going through the red wire, then they are, by definition, in parallel. Um, so I guess this is a case where it's maybe drawn a little bit tricky, because if I had drawn this red wire as coming from the corners, just like R2 is, then maybe it would have been a little more obvious, right? That is in parallel with the whole thing. But just that simple thing of moving the wire in a little bit changes nothing about the behavior of the circuit, but it makes our brains automatically like kind of think R1 is different and that we're just shorting R2. Anyway, all three of them in parallel, so I add this resistance with zero resistance, which mathematicians don't like this, but one over zero is infinity. We'll just call it infinity, and so we get one over R12 is equal to infinity, and so if we flip that over, we just find that R12, or the equivalent resistance of these three branches is just zero. In other words, adding a wire with zero resistance in parallel to a bunch of resistors just basically eliminates them. The circuit now ignores them because none of the current is gonna flow through them. All of it's gonna prefer this infinitely easy path. Another way to think of it, we have a junction on one side and a junction on the other, right? And as we get from one side to the other, we have to have the same voltage drop no matter which branch we take, right? Same rule for series, or sorry, for parallel branches. We know going through this branch, the red wire, there's no resistance, right? So we can't have a voltage drop. And if so, there's no voltage drop across this path, and we have to have the same voltage drop across every path, then no current can go through R1 and R2, right? Because these R1 and R2 are not zero, and so if delta V or I times R has to be, then I2 and I1 have to be zero. So I hope that one of those ways of explaining it, I hope one of those ways of explaining it caught on with you, um, but when you short branches of a, of a circuit, the current through them is zero and you only get current through the short side. So uh, yeah, so the equivalent resistance of this whole circuit now is just R3 uh, because all of the current goes through R3, then all of it comes through this bottom wire and one and two are ignored. So now I'm gonna do a clicker question and then we'll kind of do a little experiment to, to check something like it. So we have a very similar circuit like we just showed. The third resistor is on the other side now, but it doesn't really matter. All three of these light bulbs have the same resistance, and when we first hook up the circuit, they're all lit, and then I connect this wire as a short down at the bottom. And I'm asking you what's going to happen to the brightness of the three bulbs. So they're all on, then I connect 
this short wire here, what's going to happen to the brightness? And this one's kind of tricky. Uh, again, do the same thing. Work on it a little by yourself if you want, and then chat with the people around you. See if you agree. And I put the power expressions up there because brightness of light bulbs is determined by the power. Give you 30 more seconds. Okay, so let's before we work through it together. Let's do an experiment and see if we can infer what's going to happen. So I don't have three light bulbs here, but I have something pretty similar. I just have two light bulbs in series. So imagine like light bulb two wasn't there. I just have a circuit with light bulb three and light bulb one. So current comes out of this battery, goes through the wire, goes through one light bulb, goes through the other, and back in. And now I'm going to short one of the light bulbs. And what I mean by that is I'm going to connect this wire with no resistance in parallel with it. So now the current can go through the, from the battery through the wire, but then through this black wire instead of this light bulb, and then all of it has to go through this other one. So let's see what happens. Wow, okay. So we found the one that was in, that I, I shorted, that I put this blank wire in parallel with it, that one went out. And then what happened to the other light bulb? So here's beforehand. They have equal brightness. Here's the, so pay attention to this one. When I short the other one, what happens to it? It gets brighter. So let's apply that here. Again, ignoring light bulb two to start off with. We have light bulb three. I short it. What does that do? Well, now none of the current is going to go through light bulb three. All of it is going to go through here. And so if there's no current going through 3, if i is 0, then the power dissipation, and thus the brightness, is 0. So 3 goes out. Then, I mean, there's a couple ways to see it. But if we no longer have a voltage drop in this part of the circuit, then all of the voltage drop has to happen through light bulb 1. Does that make sense? So before we had the current going through either three or like two and three, whatever, current going through these resistors, losing some voltage, and then going through one and losing the rest. No matter what, it has to lose a total of epsilon volts in order to satisfy the loop rule. So if we take these light bulbs out of the equation, short them out so there's no more voltage drop here, then the entire voltage drop has to be through light bulb one. And so, I mean, if we use the third power equation here, delta V goes up. R doesn't change, right? That's just the R1, which that stays, the light bulbs stay the same. And so light bulb 1 has to get brighter. And if we think more explicitly about 2, 2 and 3 are both in parallel with each other, right? So this shorted wire also shorts out 2. And so 2 goes out along with 3. Another way we could think about this is we have some equivalent resistance before we shorted it out, right? The equivalent resistance with 2 and 3 and then 1. And then once we add the short, the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit goes down, right? Because now these resistors, even though they're in series, or sorry, in parallel and have a low equivalent resistance, there is still some resistance added by having those light bulbs there. And if we take them out of the question, now there's no resistance in that branch. Now the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit goes down. And so the current goes up, right? Same battery lower equivalent resistance, the total current goes up. And since light bulb 1 sees that total current, if the total current increases, the brightness is going to increase as well. 
Um, okay, so that one was maybe moderately tricky. This next one, I think, is even more tricky. It's very similar, except now I'm asking what happens to the brightness when light bulb three burns out? So this is essentially like snipping the wire here. Light bulb three is no longer in the picture. No current can get through here. So it's just two and one. What happens to the brightness of the other two bulbs when light bulb three burns out? I'll give you 30 more seconds. OK, just curious, raise your, like for the people that were chatting with neighbors, raise your hand if you did not know the person that you were talking to before today. OK, raise your hand if you were chatting with someone that you know from before. OK, cool. Kudos to the people who talk to strangers. I probably wouldn't. Um, that's risky. Um, OK. I'm kidding. No, the collaboration is really good. I think that, I mean, that's what this class is mainly about everywhere except lecture. Um, okay, so the answer is D, that two gets brighter and one gets dimmer. And that might be a surprise, but let's, let's walk through this together. So like, as always, with a lot of these circuit problems, there's many ways you could view this in like order of operations. And here's just one, one way, the way that is maybe most clear to me. So first, looking at light bulb, uh, one. So using the same like REQ total current method that I talked about at the end of the other example. So when three is still burning, we have an equivalent resistance of R over two, right? So we have two resistors in parallel. Maybe you didn't know that off the top of your head, but you could quickly solve that the equivalent resistance of these two would be one half the resistance of a single light bulb, and then that in series with a single one. So we'd have a total resistance here, an equivalent resistance of three R over two, three halves R. Then when three burns out, now we just have two light bulbs in series with each other. So we have an equivalent resistance of two R, which is greater. So when light bulb three burns out, the equivalent resistance actually goes up. Even though there's less light bulbs there, really what we're doing is reducing the amount of paths that the current has. So if the equivalent resistance goes up, the total current that the battery pumps out is lower. It's harder for the battery to pump current, so I total is lower. And so if the I total that light bulb one sees goes down, then it's gonna be less bright. And to prove that we can, I'd say the second power expression, I squared R, is the best thing to look at. Because again, R is not changing, that's just the resistance of light bulb one. If I uh, goes down, then power dissipation and thus brightness goes down. So one has to go down, one gets dimmer. Light bulb two, a um, couple ways to see it, I guess. The more explicit way, I think, is, is using the loop rule. So this, is, this loop rule, epsilon minus delta V2 minus delta V1 that I've written here, this applies whether or not light bulb three is lit or burned out, right? No matter whether that other branch is there, we can always make a loop that goes through the battery, goes through R2, and goes through R1. So we're, what we just found out before is that delta V1 goes down, right? The current through one 
goes down, and so the voltage drop across light bulb one also goes down when light bulb three burns out. So if delta V1 in this equation decreases, epsilon doesn't change, and so in order for this to still be true, delta V2 has to go up to compensate for that. We see why that is? So no matter what, the loop, the loop rule has to be satisfied, so I have to go through the battery, pick up epsilon volts, and then all the resistors I go through have to total to taking away that epsilon volts. And so if now I'm losing less at, v, at uh, light bulb one, at R1, the rest of it has to be made up for at light bulb two. So that's one way to see why light bulb two gets brighter. This way is less, uh, I guess, less explicit because you have to do, I mean, we'll, we'll see why, but another way to think about it, before we decided that I total uh, goes down a little bit, right? The total current goes down because the equivalent resistance goes up. However, when light bulb three is burning, R2 only gets half of that total current, right? Because half of it goes through R2, half of it goes through R3. When light bulb three burns out, all of the current goes through I, uh, R2. So it gets the full current instead of half of it. So the reason that's not a complete explanation is because I total does decrease as well. So we haven't, with that, just that, we haven't proved that doubling the amount, like the percentage of the current is going to overcome the fact that the total current still decreases. It turns out to be true, right? This, this way there's no, like th this is foolproof reasoning with the, the loop rule. Uh, but I don't know, it's still, it's still worth noting that now all of the current goes through two um, instead of half of it. So the answer was D, that two gets uh, brighter and one gets dimmer. Yeah? It would. Yeah, yeah, so what, that's why the total resistance goes up. Because, yeah, the one and two in series has a higher equivalent resistance than two and three in parallel in series as one. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Um, okay, so again, this reasoning, I think, it's not super easy. Like, this, this type of thing gets a, like, takes a while, I think, to get the hang of, whether it's for, like, Bernoulli equation, like on problem three of your quiz, one way to answer it could have been like labeling terms in Bernoulli's equation is like, oh, this one's increasing, so this one has to go down, whatever. But it's very helpful, um, and so that's one thing that I want you to, to practice in this course. Um, but I'll admit it's not easy. Okay, so now we're just going to zoom out a bit. Um, we've talked about fluids, we talked about electrical circuits, and we saw that there's a lot of similarity in the way that we talk about them. Um, and so we can, use a model that's more general, that can apply not just to fluids and electrical circuits, but also to heat flow and diffusion um, and, and other things too, and it's called line the linear transport model. And so if you look at this equation, it looks a lot like what we've been doing so far. On the left-hand side, there's delta phi. That's just gradient, or like it's just a change from like high to low. For fluid circuits, well, there's like total heads, so like potential kinetic and pressure, but just Thinking about it is just pressure for now. On that side, we have some change in pressure from high to low. And then on the right-hand side, we have a current and a resistance. So the higher the change in pressure, the greater the flow rate. The higher the resistance, the lower the flow rate. Same thing with electrical circuits. Here now, our delta phi is delta V, a change in voltage. Current flows from high voltage to low voltage. There's some resistance in between, and combining those two things together, some flow rate results. And again, if we increase the voltage difference, so like maybe put in a stronger battery, we get more current. If we increase the resistance of the circuit, we get smaller current. And the same thing can happen with heat flow. So now, instead of change in voltage or change in pressure, delta phi could be a change in temperature. I mean, let's say we have a cooler that's cold and the surrounding air that's hot. So there's some temperature change between the two. That's our energy difference, energy density difference, and there's some resistance in between them. That's the, the cooler itself that is preventing heat from just flowing freely, and some current results, some flow of heat from the air into the cooler 
that's eventually going to bring them toward equilibrium uh, results. And so this, and the same thing happens with diffusion, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, just a note, we're not, I'm not going to assess you at all on the linear transport model explicitly. So your, the questions on quizzes and the exam will just be fluids or electrical circuits. Um, you'll never, you'll see it in DL, but you won't have to do any like heat flow or diffusion on an exam. So don't worry too much about like units and like understanding these um, at a nitty gritty level. It's more just seeing how this model can apply to a lot of different physical scenarios. Um, the other thing to note is that so far we've only been talking about steady state, right? When things don't change in time, there is flow, current or fluid is flowing through a system, but the change, the delta phi, so either my delta P between two points or my change in voltage between two points in a circuit, that doesn't change. However, that's not always what happens in the real world. Um, one example, like the drinking through a cup, like, or drinking through a straw from a cup that we talked about, I had to assume that the water level in the cup was not changing in order for it to be steady state. But we know that's not true. In real life, the water level would drop, and so it wouldn't be steady state. The delta P, or the delta P potential energy maybe, would change. Same thing with the example I just gave with like a cooler, right? We know that there is some temperature difference between the cooler and the air around us, but as heat flows from the air into the cooler, the temperature is going to change and the temperatures are going to grow closer together. And this delta phi, or delta T in this case, is gonna shrink. And so our flow rate is not constant. Things are changing in time. And that's where we're moving to next lecture, is looking what happens specifically in electrical circuits with capacitors, how that works. Yeah. Yeah, so this is concentration, um, delta C. No, yeah, you're right. It's uh, ions per second. Yeah, so that's the, the notation's a little. It's not, ch I mean, I, I, you could probably could quantify ions as amount of charge, but usually we talk about it as like a, as a density, like number of molecules per volume, maybe. Um, you'll, I think you do, what'd you say? Exactly, yeah, so th this is something that you might be familiar with, or like see in like chemistry or something like that. Um, so that's why we mention these things, like heat flow and uh, diffusion are things that you'd probably run into a lot in, in biological sciences area. Um, so it's good to see how they work. So just seeing like three models here, the first two are things we've seen before, battery and a resistor, there's our epsilon, that's our delta V, uh, we have a pump, that's our delta, uh, like that's our delta phi there, the pump in the bottom, there's some resistance. So it's, it's clear, it's easy to see why these first two scenarios fit into the uh, linear transport model that we just described, and now we're gonna extend it into heat flow. So in this case we have a hot reservoir, so just, I don't know, it's hot up here, cold down here, and there's some stuff in between, and this is our resistance. The stuff is preventing or slowing down the heat flow between the hot and the cold. The only thing to add here or mention, I guess, so delta T, that's our difference in temperature. Resistance, that's the resistance, of course, so the greater the difference in temperature, the faster the flow, and the greater the resistance, the slower, because it's in the denominator. Here, P just means power. P is a flow rate, so it's I, it's a current, but in the case of heat flow, the thing that's flowing is just energy itself. And so energy per second, that's like the flow rate of energy is just, is defined as power. It's measured in watts. So I don't know, that's a unit thing. That's the type of nitty gritty that you don't need to like worry about for being able to reproduce. But, uh, so here's our, our linear transport model. I guess we could put a, a negative sign there if we wanted to be more particular for dissipation, but the flow rate of heat is proportional to the temperature and resistance, and R depends on what the material is in between the hot and the cold, right? So a cooler made out of styrofoam is gonna have a very high resistance. It's going to allow for very slow, a low flow rate of heat through it. But if you had something like tin foil, that allows for a very quick dissipation of heat. Um, and so R of tin foil would be very small. So this is a kind of fun example. If it doesn't like completely sink in right now, I encourage you to take a look at it later. But uh, I'll just kind of, like you can read through it, but I'm just gonna kind of summarize uh, because it's a lot of text to read. So basically we have a hot coffee and some cold cream. And we wanna consume the coffee and cream together 
in our physics lecture this morning. And we want to know, and so like the goal is to drink the combination as hot as possible. I want my coffee with cream to be as hot as possible. And so to achieve that, should I put the cream in now at home and then walk to lecture and drink it there all the, all the time it has to cool off? Or should I take the hot coffee and cold cream separately with me to lecture and combine them just before I drink it? Which of those re will result in a hotter final beverage? Combining them first and then waiting, or waiting, then combining them. So think about it for a sec. Just make a guess. Don't worry about, we don't have time to, to really solve it ourselves. But make a guess. Raise your hand if you think you should combine them first and then go to lecture. Raise your hand if you think you should wait till you get to lecture, carry them separately, and then combine them. OK, let's take a look. So uh, forget you saw that if you did. So here's, this is a terribly photocopied graph, but it, it has the information we need. These two curves, which it's not even easy to tell the difference between them, but one's bold and the other's not. But these two curves show us the rate, like basically the cooling of the coffee. On the y-axis, we have temperature. And on the x, we have time. So both of them follow this overall trend, of course, that as time passes, they cool down. The temperature lowers. And so let's look at curve two first. Curve two is the one where we wait until we get to class to add the cream. Right? So we start at some temperature of 120 something degrees Fahrenheit. And as we go to class, it takes 10 minutes. It cools down right? just because we have hot coffee and it's dumping heat into the air around it. And then once we get to class, we add the cream, which is cold. And it just shocks the coffee and instantly lowers its temperature down to this lower curve here. And then it can continue to cool off. However, what if we added the cream right away? So now we're still at home. We add the cream. It shocks it to a lower temperature, not as low as we end up with in the other one because we haven't walked to class yet. And now from this lower temperature, we walk to class, and it cools off. And you see that curve one, by the time we drink it when we get to class, actually is hotter than curve two by a couple degrees. So we found that you should actually add the cream first and then walk to class. And the reason ends up being that, remember the model we just set up, the flow rate, like how quickly the heat dissipates from the hot to the cold, depends on uh, the difference in temperature. right? The greater the difference in temperature, the faster the flow. Yeah? Yeah, it is. So that's that's. I guess that's the uh, the cream is in a refrigerated cup or something. You know, something like that. But it would make more. Sense. Yeah, it would make. Yeah. So that's that's a good that's a good point. But assuming the cream's at the same temperature, like the the gist of it is, we want the coffee to be cooler while we walk to class because when it is cooler, the flow rate, the rate at which it cools off, will be smaller. So we shock it to get cold. And then it's less different in temperature than the air around it. And so it gives off heat at a lower rate. Um, so take a look at this. Think about it more if you want. Uh, but this is more just to challenge us. You're not going to be quizzed on this exactly.